Your property podcast comes to you with thanks to our friends at Trafalgar Square Finance, leading independent specialists in mortgages and all types of property finance. Whether it's buy to let, development or bridging finance, Trafalgar Square can help you organise your funding for your next property project. Exclusively to listeners of Your Property Podcast, Trafalgar Square offer a free one-to-one consultation. So whether you are a portfolio landlord looking to raise funds on your existing portfolio, or if you're just starting out and want to find out if you are eligible for a buy-to-let mortgage, Trafalgar Square Finance can help. It's easy to book with one of their experienced consultants by simply visiting yourpropertynetwork.co.uk forward slash finance. You can find this link in the show notes for more details. Hello and welcome to Your Property Podcast. My name is Michelle Kearns and today we've got with us Sen Wharton. Hi, hi, Sen. Hi, Michelle. Thanks for having me here. Great to have you. And uh, yeah, it's interesting because I uh, your name has kind of popped up a few times in various different places and you caught my attention uh, because yeah, I saw you were um, talking about service accommodation as part of your business model. Um, and recently we've had Daniel Priestley on the podcast as well. So I know we cross paths over there and it's always good to um, be interviewing people within our tribe, within our communities and, you know, where people have got shared interests. And obviously you have been also a long time subscriber to the magazine as well. So it's great to eventually have you on. Um, and I know you've done various trainings through, you know, uh, different property educators uh, that we're all familiar with. But um, let's just, you know, just tell us a bit about yourself for people who don't know uh, who you are. OK, well, thank you um, again for having me here. Real pleasure and an honour. As I say, I've been subscribing to YPN since it's either 2007 or 2008, but around when it started and uh, I've learned so much from it, reading those pages, met loads of great people, uh, many of whom I work with. So yeah, I just can't recommend it enough to those people listening to, to keep on reading it. So to try and cut down, I guess, the life story as it relates to property, it started for me, like it does for many, with having read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Um, absolute um, light bulb moment uh, back when I was, what, 24? So when I read that, uh, but it took a couple of years to marinate and I did start investing in property in 2006 and it was just a very gradual, slow start. And I'd say doing it on my own, um, working a job full time, it took me about eight years or so to become financially independent. Um, but this result still came. That was great. And getting to the point, and this point I was going through buy to lets and HMOs, small commercial conversions. I got to about 2015 and maybe hit the ceiling and looked for other options. And by 2016, I'd discovered the idea of service accommodation. And um, that's really where I guess the next chapter of the journey took off, which I guess what we'll be talking more about today. Yeah, well, 2016 is quite old in terms of the uh, service accommodation education world. Well, I'm and showing my age obviously... here now. <laughs> I probably, it's, it's obviously been around forever in terms of Airbnb and uh, and hosting, um, but in the form that it is today, you know, it has taken quite the property education world by storm. And certainly it feels like it's the, you know, the hot topic at the moment. So it's great to hear from you that, you know, you've actually been been doing this for quite a number of years now and you have come to it with a you know with it with the experience of the other strategies as well so yeah um you know I'm making the assumption you've moved into this strategy for the cash flow um is that correct and if it is is it is it what you expected yeah great question it absolutely uh was that reason for getting into it back in 2016 um, picking up on that little intro, I'd felt like I'd hit a complete ceiling with my knowledge and with what I'd done with buy to lets and HMOs. And it had taken me so long going about the portfolio building that way whilst working full time that I thought, wow, 
I'm financially independent, but by no means abundant. Back in 2015, 16, I thought if I want to get to where my ambitions are taking me, something's going to have to massively change because it's going to take me forever going at the pace I was going before. And that's why service accommodation was so appealing, I guess, was seeing that differential because I was so familiar with buy to let where the typical buy to let will get you a couple hundred pounds a month seeing the opportunity no guarantee but the opportunity to get up to a thousand pounds plus was like wow I need to figure out how to do this um so it was very much cash flow driven to start with um and forgive me what was the other part of that question well, just whether it was what you expected it to be, because I think service accommodation is quite a different business strategy. Uh, and I use yes. that word intentionally there, you know, yeah. with single lets, it's possible to be, you know, quite hands off if you've got an agent managing it. HMOs, you can have agents manage it. It's still a lot of work to it. But service accommodation, uh, as I see it, is, is more of a it's just a different business model and requires a lot more upfront setting up. So uh, how did you find that? initial phase of you know, getting everything set up and yeah. having people kind of moving you know people staying every day every night rather than long-term tenants yeah baptism of fire completely <laughs> um and it's not to say that it can't be the hands-off urge like I've come to learn that it can be when you understand what you're doing but when myself my business partner Chris Dornan we we joined forces in 2016 at the same time and um started this new rent to rent essay company we had done one is that actually even before we did a course i think we just jumped straight in and did it and did a course after we had our first one up and running um we went in with the intention to do a lot of it ourselves and so that did look like the excitement of sourcing it finding it furnishing it because obviously that's the attractive part many people see is that they, they like the idea of putting on their interior design hat and, uh, and making somewhere look appealing and getting the photographs done so it gets listed. And all of it was very, very new to us. And I've come to learn, I don't like interior design. I'm not good at it. <laughs> um, but there's also limitations of what you can do with a rent to rent. Yeah, so it was within the parameters of the existing uh, decor, what can we add to it to make it look a bit more appealing, furnishing, soft furnishing, et cetera. But we really were uh, absolute newbies at it. And as we did get a business up and running, we realized it was quite a, I always described it as uh, an operational octopus with so many like different it. moving parts to it. And um, yeah, we can go into more detail about it if, if you wish, but what did I expect of it beforehand? I guess I didn't go into expecting anything other than that this is going to be a learning journey. Uh, yeah. But I'm up for it and uh, I'm willing to put into it enough to get this thing up and running. And right. it was a complete learning journey. <laughs> so tell us about, so you started off with Rent to SA then, and uh, you obviously had a bit of background knowledge with the HMOs and singlets and, and having done some, yeah. you know, some education before that. So uh, your first deal, how did you secure it and what was the negotiation like with the landlord? Yeah, so the first deal took quite a while to, to land. But I think a lot of that came about because we were trying to do three or four different strategies at once. Like many people do when they get into property education, we try to do deal sourcing, rent to rent, buy to let, um, perhaps a flip. And Chris and I were trying to do all four things. So it was getting a small amount of our attention. But when we did can ask, decide... Sorry, can I just jump yeah. in and ask? Um, when you say it took a long time to get started so once you uh did you do all four at one time and then it just happened to be one of the four or did you do all four yeah, it wasn't really point. working and then just focus on that I say long time it, it, it wasn't long I we're talking months so it's very quick in the grand scheme of things um with the impatience of someone with shiny penny syndrome it seemed like yeah. a long time because <laughs> yeah. we were trying to do from March 2016, when we'd started some mentorship, um, we were trying to do four different property strategies at once. And so we were very diluted and we were busy idiots. And it was at the point of June, we decided we're getting no results in any of these. 
let's just double down, focus on service accommodation, rent to rent. And then right. it happened quickly. And then we right. got from, all right, that commitment in June to having secured the first one in July, ready for the Edinburgh Festival. So I'm based in Scotland, I should have said. Right. And I live about 45 minutes from Edinburgh. And so we thought, you can't go wrong in Edinburgh. It's the mecca of service accommodation. This is where we're going to do it. Um, so the process of it was via agents. And it was looking at properties that we thought would be affordable to us, one and two bed properties, central Edinburgh, tourist central in our minds, bearing in mind we didn't know any different, we were making assumptions. And then it was contacting agents. And we basically went from, we were playing the numbers, it was anything from going to, a, in 2016, a block viewing of a property with 12 other prospects, many professionals, and then me pitching to the agent, uh, I'm not like a typical tenant, this is what I'd like to do. And some would be absolutely, what, get lost kind of thing. Others would be, all right, okay, that's interesting. Let me have Super Manager about it. So I've got a real mix of responses, but eventually, you know, don't be put off folks, listen to this. It's become so much more widely understood and accepted. And it's quite common for agents to work with a corporate as in limited company to let to. And so, yeah, I did find agents willing to work with us and we're able to get the first let secured. So from June, that commitment secured it, July, got it ready for the end of July. And it was then ready to go for the Edinburgh Festival in August. Wow. So it was pretty quick. Yeah, I bet you were like rubbing your hands together at Edinburgh Festival, right? <laughs> So if only they were like those nightly rates every night of the year, right? <laughs> but yeah. that must have seen you through, you know, the cold, you know, the um, quieter winter months. Well, well, this is where the story gets interesting because uh, it's a story. I, when people ask about the journey we've had, I, I definitely see it as two tales of service accommodation or two different chapters. The first version was the tourist market, city centre very much based on guesswork and hope. And the first one up and running, it's great. It's a one bedroom flat and it turned over, it took over four grand in bookings. And after it paid everyone else, the landlord utilities, we did have an agent on the ground to help us check people in because we live 45 minutes away, but we did everything else. Uh, I think it paid us about 1200 pounds. So we thought, wow, we're off to the races with this. This is really exciting. Um, but then it was only downhill from there. Yeah. Um, because any newbie can make money in Edinburgh in the festival back then. Um, but what happened was we piled in quite quickly. And by the time we got to November of that same year, we had four rent to rents in Edinburgh and the rents were actually starting to drain us. We were in negative cash flow fairly quickly so this is where we get into this valley of despair the um emotional roller coaster of oh crap and we realize fairly quickly actually that we've created a hungry beast that's hungry for cash and it's paying everyone else except for us um now there is a good a happy ending to it but this was part of the learning curve which is why we learned some valuable, valuable lessons but um yeah that takes us up to the end of 2016 with a very valuable financial and market uh, understanding quite quickly um, that enabled us to pivot and change going forwards. Right. So for anyone who's looking to get into Rent to SA, uh, what would you advise them, bearing in mind that story that, you know, it's not the monthly cash flow that you would expect from a long term, like rental at HMOs or single lets, but you need to average out the whole year before you can start right taking yeah, profits. Well, <laughs> what I would say is it if you're going to be in the holiday space, which can be very, very lucrative in certain parts of the UK and, and, and Wales uh, and Ireland and around the world indeed, it is about really understanding what happens in January and February and June and July and flattening out the peaks and troughs so I'm saying, okay, well, what's the average going to be? And do I have the, the cash flow to maintain the cost of the business in the off months whilst I build up towards the big months? 
and that that could be totally fine. What I found was a different way of doing things, which might be, I guess, what people want to hear from this um, conversation is that I felt like I very much got into it with guesswork and hope, thinking once you got this property, pop it up there, put an advert out, people will come. Um, what I learned is that people might come, but they might not. Um, and so we want to reduce all the, that risk and make the whole business model as bulletproof and certain as possible. And so to pick up on the story, when I went into that Christmas of 2016, feeling quite down and sorry about things, it made me and Chris look at things differently and put on, I guess, a different perspective to see our market and thought, right, we're never gonna put ourselves in that position again. We have to pivot and make sure that if we go and launch on the property, it's based off the back of a level of demand and a commitment that gives us confidence. And so we went about the whole thing differently, flipped it on its head. And from the new year of 2017, we went from a standing start in a new market, zero properties, new market, standing start, zero to profit in 45 days. And so things changed dramatically. And that new business, which I'll, I'll touch on, is what we have then grown and what we still run successfully today, whatever that is, five, six years later, mm -hmm. thanks to all those valuable lessons earlier on. And the big difference was we went to go and look for an audience to serve first and foremost. So we started with a demand and it happened to be that I'd been to a service accommodation major mega event in the 2016 in Birmingham. You may have even been there, I don't know. Um, and people were talking about contractors. And I thought, right, this sounds really interesting. They stay for longer. So I can do one changeover per week and have full occupancy if so long as seven night stays across multiple weeks. That's the market I'd like to actually go after rather than just seeing what happens. And so I did. Um, in those 45 days I talked about, I focused all efforts looking to build relationships with agents who place contractors into accommodation. So I thought if I can build a relationship with one or two or three organizations that could give me access to multiple bookings, I can really speed up and scale this process and have more certainty. And that outreach of emails and texts and phone calls did bring fruition and demand. And what it led to was me essentially getting a very hot lead over email and phone for, it was six guys needing accommodation for five and a half months. Um, thankfully, mm -hmm. they're not too distant area from where I am. And so, wow, I've actually got a real demand here. I need to serve this. And it's like probably lighting a fire under your, your rear, but I didn't have the property. So I thought, this is an interesting quandary. I actually went out, Michelle, looking for existing holiday let operators to say, if I can't fill this myself with a property I have, I have to at least place it, have the relationship and take a booking commission. But interestingly, I found that everyone I spoke to who had holiday lets, they were on Airbnb, they had little cute, quaint mom and pop farmhouse things on their own websites in the area. They all had little three night, four night stays smattered across the calendar and they couldn't accommodate my five and a half month request. So part of my head was thinking, great opportunity. No one's serving the longer market. But what it did do is lead me to an introduction to a farmer who had a single at cottage coming up. So Brilliant. networking introductions, long story short, I took pictures of that property and I pitched it to the client by email and phone and essentially got commitment in advance. Say, so if I furnish this property and I meet your budget requirement, which was 20 pounds per man per night, so 3,600 a month, if I do that, will you let it off me for this amount? And I got confirmation over email. So that, right, that'll do, that'll get me started. I then went and signed the lease, 800 pounds a month, okay. got it furnished. And then in that week of Valentine's week in February, the day after it was furnished, six guys moved in and I had a five and a half month runway of 
profit from day one. Wow. And so that then transformed the way we looked at the entire rent to rent for SA mm -hmm. model. And we scaled that by networking and developing relationships with the same end user audience, that company, other companies like that, to very quickly scale more that year. Um, there was a major energy from waste plant being built for about three years, two, three years. And so we, we accommodate a lot of the contractors for that. Mm -hmm. But it's the model that's important. Um, so going back to the original question about flattening out the, the months, if I was in the holiday space, I absolutely would be doing that. In other markets where you might have commitments of several months, then you can project, uh, I guess, quite differently. So, so we've yeah. built our business largely off contractors, but then second, secondly, we've come into the space of emergency accommodation, uh, which is still a service accommodation offering, but it's to our local authority and it's not yeah. seasonal. So we can project that very differently versus the holiday market, but it's a different product offering. Right, okay. So it's interesting. Um, and I'm sure it was a lot more peace of mind going for that contractor market as well, because you, you like, as you say, you can kind of predict a lot easier. So I know you started out with the rent to SA with the service accommodation, and then you moved to purchasing later on. So did your strategy change in how you were operating once you were buying because you had more, uh, perhaps there was more cash flow, more, more margin? Uh, or did you keep everything the same? It was largely the same. So the, one of the first purchases we, we, we made, uh, which was just a year after. No, actually, it was the, the same year we got the SA business going with rent to rent for contractors. Having proved the model, it gave us confidence in looking at options outside of what that we uh, what we normally would have looked at we started looking for for guest houses right and so we actually acquired a five bedroom guest house because the bed spaces available in it would mean we could accommodate more contractors so we did kind of go all in on the contractor side early right. on uh we knew that it could also serve the holiday market as well but it was predominantly focused on contractors um and so that was the first acquisition, which was based on a per man, per room or per bed night. So we could right. scale up. We had 11 beds in this bed spaces. So we could scale up the potential revenue to our financing costs of it. And so that was very, very lucrative. Um, but we're sensible in those. Well, we are still are sensible, not saying in those days. We're very lean in how we ran our business yeah. and we would reinvest and reinvest because we wanted to grow a proper business it wasn't a case of let's just get five and that will pay for our lifestyle yeah we're actually going to create a business so we put a lot of thought and effort into that and so we didn't um overspend along the journey so to speak right and i'm curious you said you got a guest house for the first one um was that anything to do with future proofing the business and being able to choose it uh because it was the c1 classification and because I know that Scotland have had some changes with service accommodation recently. So yeah. have you been affected by that? And has that guest house stood that, you know, um, the test the time? The absolutely. Test, yeah, yeah. Um, I wish I could say we had that foresight in 2017, 18. <laughs> um, I did start to see the writing on the wall in Edinburgh in 2018. Right. Um, so those first ones we started with, we started to wind ourselves out to them because they were literally only profitable in the summer. Um, but also we started to find the, the community for service accommodation operators in Edinburgh were letting us, helping us become aware of planning restrictions. Um, and when this is happening, like London, Edinburgh, Glasgow, we thought, ah, we don't want to be around when when the door closed on that, so we'll we'll get out now. Um, and obviously now everyone knows in Scotland, you have to be licensed everywhere, regardless of which local authority area, but some will be uh, virtually impossible, like Edinburgh, to 
get planning unless you have a purpose-built block. A tenement flat, for example, wouldn't get the um, planning approved. But back then, um, we're in a neighbouring region, uh, local authority area to City of Edinburgh. And yes, buying a guest house gave us the right use class that made, you know, no worry, kind of sleep well at night. But we mm -hmm. weren't seeing at that point there being an issue down the line. I mean, now, yeah, yeah. I mean, my, my license application is is going in for that property as we speak. Um, but I don't have any worries because it's got the right use class, um, which is not a problem. So yeah, we no longer operate in the city center and we don't operate where there are these tight controls in place that will make it more challenging. There are other places we can go to still do our business um, that don't have as challenging restrictions. Fair enough. Okay, so uh, just kind of zooming out then, I know you've been on yeah. various different uh, property education trainings and uh, business training as well. So how do you look at the, you know, where you're at today with the hindsight of everything you've done so far? Um, are there any like big changes in how you're looking at things or uh, are you just kind of happy to carry on as you are? Wow, that's quite a big question. Um, I'll, I think if I boil it, down to pinpoint, yeah, the biggest game-changing realization and conclusion that's come out of that journey that I briefly shared was having experienced the pain and frustration of jumping into something with guesswork and being property-led. In other words, let's just start the property and then figure out who's going to stay in it. We have created uh an investment philosophy if you will that is applied to every market or strategy that we that we go into which starts with a demand it's always demand led and we see ourselves now as being in a position of providing accommodation solutions so based on what that end user needs from an actual solving a problem perspective or from fulfilling uh, a high end holiday desire and we're not in that space as yet. We're more in solving problems, whether that be emergency accommodation, contractor, getting into supported living, um, other public sector contracts. Every one of those end users help define for us what property we're looking for, where it needs to be, what other service offerings need to come with it to solve that problem. Because what that's doing is helping us remove the guesswork. Now, nothing's 100% guaranteed ever. You, just like everyone talked about, you'll always need your second, third, and fourth options, but it gives us a real reason to seek out a certain type of property in a certain location. Mm -hmm. Even if we've never been to that geographic location before, if we have a relationship with the end user demand, we can go into a new area to fulfill the accommodation requirement they have, it just takes a bit longer, but it's all demand led. And as I say, whether that be in service accommodation or in a block of single lets or in a de development of sort or commercial, that is the overarching ethos philosophy that keeps us de-risked to a degree and will make us more attractive to people who invest with us um, because of some certainty and security. And just make us more happy with what we're doing and with with our funds and other people's funds and it just makes more sense um and it all came thanks to the mistake we made early on yeah that's brilliant okay so in terms of like the stage you're at now then you've gone you, you know through a very clear journey with the single x hmos service accommodation and I know you do some training as well. So what are you up to now? And, um, you know, where can people find out more about what you're doing? Yeah. So main focus, first and foremost, is Chris and I are very much still on the front line as property investor entrepreneurs. We have a couple of property businesses. So the service accommodation business is largely run day to day by a couple of property managers. I still oversee the strategy of it. So that probably takes about 10% of the, of the time. The main focus of time is 
you asked the question earlier about service accommodation and cash flow. So thanks to the early efforts in service accommodation and that business being started and, and built and established, that essentially solved the cash flow problem. Yeah. And we have a solid cash flow business. And we realized that we don't need to grow that to a crazy size and have a very noisy, difficult operational business. We've got a great profitable business at the size it is. We now can focus more on the long-term asset creation, whether that be through developing. So my business partner, Chris, is a builder by trade. Okay. So it's great having his expertise on the team. Um, so is it through development or is it through acquiring existing assets? But either way, our 70% focus is absolutely on adding equity to our balance sheet, if you will, through okay. acquiring assets. That'll be long-term stuff that will be blocks of flats predominantly that we will develop or acquire to put on long leases. Uh, always demand-led, of course. So that's the main focus, property investing-wise, whilst we still need to slowly grow the SA business. And then about 20% of our time is focused very much on something we've become really passionate about, which is a natural journey for, for many, which is starting to, I guess, turn around and, and help others, emerging entrepreneurs on their journey. Um, we've been mentoring in small mastermind groups for about five years now, and I've really grown to love helping people achieve their, their the life they desire through property. Uh, Chris and I found that property is the ideal, in our mind, vehicle to create the life, the wealth that you desire and make the impact that you desire. Um, but it is a whole life mastery game, I think. It's not just about bricks and mortar, about cash. It's about everything else that comes into it, the, the health, your relationships, where your values lie. And we like to tie all those bits of the puzzle together because uh, it's what means most to us. And I think that our, our, our journey is still very much mid-flow, but the things that we've learned to date, we get, a, I guess, a, a huge amount of satisfaction and reward to use some of the lessons we've had. You know, we don't sugarcoat the mistakes we've had. We're quite proud of them now but to use that to help other people accelerate their journeys to where they want to get to. So yeah, about 20% of our time is in small mastermind groups, helping coach and mentor people to achieve and execute their, their, their goals for their, their longer term plans and their, and their goals of the life they want to have. Right. And when you're in with the masterminders, uh, how do you, see their journey is it very similar to the journey that you have as in you know the, the way the market is and uh, and the beliefs they have I guess around around their own investing around their own abilities uh, do, you, do you see themes that stop people from achieving the goals that they want to set if so what are they are do you have any any answers for that <laughs> yeah absolutely um there's always patterns, there's always themes. So I'd say two things to it. What's going on in our economy and in the background will always be variable and always be there. Um, I remember hearing someone's wise words, I think it was probably Dan, Dan Hill's words, that the economy is like uh, weather. It's like bad weather going on, might have good weather sometimes, bad weather at times, but it in the whole, it shouldn't stop you going out about your business doing your thing as long as you equip yourselves with the right clothing umbrella and so on and so forth and i guess it's the same thing in property it's just being aware of how to play the game slightly differently depending on the economic conditions so that's always going on and it'll always stifle people or provide opportunities but the biggest thing biggest pattern i would say and you asked for what kind of advice it's the head game uh, it, I've found that both personally and with people Chris and I have worked with, that success in property is 80, 90% a psychological thing. And the best words I can use to put this in, again, I wish I came up with these words, they're not mine. I, I heard this from Ed Milet, who you might have heard his podcast. Um, he, he's a guy I listen to a lot. But he described 
the challenge that people have in getting either started or going to the next stage sits around a certain threshold of belief that we set for ourselves, a threshold of what we believe we need to know in order to get started. And the big difference here is that those people we see going out and taking big action and making big things happen have been able to lower their threshold of what they believe they need to know in order to get started. And those who are struggling have got it set at a level that is preventing them from getting started. And what I'm getting at here is to find this get started point, not to take away. So I have quite perfectionist type tendencies, meaning if anyone else has the same thing, it could be quite hard to get yourself started because you think you want to know every single step to getting from ground one to a six figure essay business. But the fact is that's just not reality. What we need to do is lower our threshold of belief to just what are the first two, three steps to make some progress and have the faith in ourselves and belief in ourselves or have the belief and backing of a mentor group and a peer group or a community like YPN to know that by following the process and trusting the process and getting those first three steps done, we will on the journey figure out the third, fourth, fifth, sixth step. That is the biggest thing, if I was to try and boil it down, that will help people go from either starting or from where they are to the next phase and the next phase. And that never goes away, folks. It never stops. But we just get more conscious and better at understanding the psychology game and uh, addressing it with more wisdom and experience. So don't be cavalier and say, I'm going to bring my threshold right down to zero and jump in reckless. All I'm saying is that you find a process from one of these courses and you see social proof and you have faith in yourself to take action and follow through and take those first two, three steps and believe that you can figure out the rest as you get going. So true. You really need to be investing in yourself as well as in property as well. And uh, as you said, it's a lifelong journey for both <laughs> investing strategies, it is. whether it's in your mindset or, or bricks and mortar. So Great. And I know as part of your um, mastermind group, your one of your big focuses is with the execution because, right, like Google, we've now got chat GPT. We can just get the information uh, from, you know, from anywhere, but it's actually the implementation, the execution. So uh, do you want to just tell us about the scorecard that you've created? Yeah, brilliant. Thanks for uh, asking that, Shell. So the two parts, the first thing you mentioned, yeah, absolutely, that the essence of our mastermind is about executing your property goals to achieve those, those big plans, the life you want to have. And we know that the, the problems that come about trying to execute in isolation on one's own are all solved in a small mastermind group, human connection, the need to explain what your plans are and be specific with what the actions are going to be and be held accountable by a group of peers and a mentor are some of the key ingredients to actually getting stuff done. So that's what we focus the mastermind on. It's being high leverage in where we allocate our time rather than being busy, but doing the wrong kind of stuff and not even knowing it. So that's what the mastermind focuses on helping people do. And what we've created as a bit of self-discovery um, for anyone interested, is an execution powerhouse assessment, which is very simply 17 questions that could be answered in three minutes or less that allows anyone who takes it to produce a personalized report that will highlight already what you might be pretty good at, but also highlight where some of the gaps and deficiencies may be in your ability to execute your property goals. And so this is a report that's free to free to take. Um, at the end of that, there is an opportunity to inquire about our mastermind, if that's something people are interested in. It's not for everybody, but for those uh, who are interested, there's an opportunity to inquire about it. But first and foremost, that uh, assessment, the execution powerhouse assessment, we can put a link for people to access. It's absolutely free and it produces a personalized report for everybody. Fantastic. Well, we'll put the links to the show notes and I think that'd be really useful for people. And one of my favorite, uh, you know, philosophies around 
you know investing and uh and for, especially for people who start in their journey because it feels so painfully slow at the beginning um and i i believe that's because people are focusing on the results they're focusing on how many houses they've got um you know and and, and the cash flow instead of the instead of the focus being on execution how many phone calls they're making how many letters they're sending out what are they executing on rather than what are the results they're getting so the more you execute the more results you're going to get uh, I think is, yeah, is the way I look at it. You know what it's yeah. Great. Well, I think that's a good place to wrap up. So we'll put the link to that and your social media in the show notes as well, so people can follow you and find out more about what you're up to. Wonderful. Thank you so much for having me on the podcast, Michelle. Thank you for your time, and uh, we look forward to seeing you soon. All right, then. Thanks to everyone for listening to us. And uh, as usual, the link to the free magazine is in the show notes. So if you're not yet a subscriber, do check out that link. Uh, otherwise, we'll see you next time. 